church, I'll be reading John chapter 20 from the Christian Standard Bible. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. She saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she went running to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said to him, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. At that, Peter and the other disciple went out, heading for the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and got to the tomb first. Stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then, following him, Simon Peter also came. He entered the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. The wrapping that had been on his head was not lying with the linen cloths, but was folded up in a separate place by itself. The other disciple who had reached the tomb first, then also went in, saw and believed. For they did not understand, they did not yet understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to the place where they were staying. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she was crying, she stooped to look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting where Jesus' body had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you crying? Because they've taken away my Lord, she told them, and I don't know where they've put him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Woman, Jesus said to her, why are you crying? Who is it that you are seeking? Supposing he was the gardener, she replied, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've put him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. Turning around, she said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher, don't cling to me, Jesus told her, since I have not yet ascended to the Father. But I go to my brothers, but go to my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them what he had said to her. When it was evening of that first day of the week, the disciples were gathered together with doors locked because they feared the Jews. Jesus came, stood among them, and said to them, Peace be with you. Having said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were telling him, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, If I don't see the mark of the nails in his hands, put my finger into the mark of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will never believe. A week later, his disciples were indoors again, and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then Jesus said to Thomas, Put your finger here and look at my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Don't be faithless, but believe. Thomas responded to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen yet and yet believe. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. What an epic finish to a phenomenal weekend. Fam, let me show you where we stopped on Friday. May I remind you, we read scripture together on Thursday night, and then we read scripture together on Friday morning, and this is where we stopped. We stopped at the grave site of Jesus. This is called the Garden Tomb. It's in Jerusalem at the moment. It's just outside the wall of where Jerusalem was back in the day. And this is what a garden tomb would have looked like in the first century. A hole in the wall. This tomb um, belonged to Joseph of Arimathea. And according to the Gospel of John, which we read on Friday morning, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus uh, prepared Jesus' body for burial. And that's where they left him. They lay him down in the tomb. Let me show you a picture of what it looks like inside. Right? So a place to put down a body to go through the normal decomposition. 
And then I also showed you on Friday that this specific garden tomb is marked on its door because there's good news, and that is that this tomb is empty. So I think that's the next, next picture, is that he is not here, for he is risen. We don't find these words in the Gospel of John. We find these in Matthew 28, as well as in Luke 24. But that is how the angels answer the disciples when they inquire about the whereabouts of Jesus. Okay, what's the next picture, Rudolf? Uh, yeah, there we go. A little place for the stone, right? So hole in the wall, body goes in, stone gets rolled over, and there you go. Uh, it was a thick and a heavy stone that would have rolled down that little pathway. And that's where we ended our time together on Friday. I don't know how your day was yesterday, but Saturday of Easter weekend is always a really significant day for me. Because I try and imagine what different people might have gone through in that day. Think about Joseph of Arimathea. He touched a dead body, which means that he's unclean. And now he goes back into his house, all confessing Jews. And if he touches them or he touches anything in the house, then all of that is unclean. But he believed that he had to do this, and he gave away the family tomb, right, on a whim. I think we should use this for Jesus. I sometimes wonder, like, what his conversation with his wife was like. You know, dude, did you really have to do that? Or aren't you scared of the Jewish council? Don't you think about the, uh, the consequences of this come Monday or the first day of the week, which was actually a Sunday in those days? Or was she supportive of him? Did she say, I also actually believe, but I secretly believe that now it seems like you secretly believe, but now it's not a secret anymore. So what are we going to do now? Like he was a man of good standing. Or think of Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a teacher of the law, he was well known, he was well respected, he was definitely wealthy. He pops up three times in the Gospel of John, but in the end, like physically helping Joseph to bury Jesus, he pledges allegiance to Jesus. And he might also get an email on Monday, right? Uh, Good morning all, Nicodemus, comma, boom, and then whatever the Jewish council wanted to say to him. I sometimes wonder what the conversations was like among the disciples. Listen, dude, were you at the crucifixion? No, I was way too scared. Were you? Mm -mm. No, I wasn't. I heard John was. Ah, shall we send him a WhatsApp quickly just to ask what it was like or what Jesus did? No, I feel too ashamed. Do you guys think that John is going to uh, have a laugh at us? Well, I don't know. Is John all right? Well, we don't know. It's Sabbath, right? It's like lockdown. You wake up in the morning and you do this through the course of Sabbath, and then you celebrate the end of Sabbath, and then you start the first day of the week. Like, what was those conversations like? Did Peter tell them that he betrayed Jesus? Because remember, it was only him and John outside of Caiaphas' house who actually saw the betrayal. No one else did, right? Where did you run to? Where did you sleep? Has anyone asked you any questions? I'm curious to know what the conversations was like. Think about everyone else in Jerusalem, right? They were pilgrims to the Passover festival. They saw the earth shaking, fam. They saw lightning and thunder. (laughs) They heard that something massive happened at the temple. According to Matthew, graves opened up and people were resurrected. And now you have to go home tomorrow, right? Back to work. Like, what was those conversations like? Will we know? Do you think they'll publish something at some point? Like, let's ask auntie whoever who stays in Jerusalem to keep us posted and in some way, because we have to leave now and go back to Galilee. But something went down here. What was those conversations like at the house? I mean, I can imagine kids asking, Dad, why did the earth just shake? Think about it. Like, whether you want to talk about it or not, it definitely stirred up conversations. I'm always curious to know what Saturday is like. That's why I always, this is just a side note, On the Saturday of Easter weekend, I go for a really long run. And then the only thing I think about while I run is this. So yesterday, my brother and I had a lovely two and a half hour run. And we literally just spoke about, can you imagine what it must have been like for them and for them and for them and for them. And then we spoke about preachers who inspire us. And then we spoke about our families. And then we spoke about our faith. It was a lovely day out. Here's my mission for today. My mission for today is we have to talk about the triumphant king. Because the tomb is empty. And the only question that I want to answer today is why does the triumph of the king matter? Because it does. It matters greatly. 
Here's why I think it matters. And these are also the four points of my sermon, right? So I'm going to give you the roadmap now. This is exactly where we are going. Why does the triumph of the king matter? Well, firstly, because it gives hope for the world. Secondly, it gives grace for the broken. Thirdly, it gives peace for the fearful. And fourthly, it gives truth for the skeptic. That's why the triumph of the king matters. And then you'll see the empty tomb is the hope for the world. In the interaction between Jesus and Mary Magdalene, we'll see that there's grace for the broken. In the interaction between Jesus and his disciples, we'll see that there's peace for the fearful. And then in the interaction between Jesus and Thomas, we'll see that there is truth for the skeptic. That is why this matters. So on 28 August last year, Sisle Kulu from Renewal Fellowship preached here. And he also preached on the resurrection. And he did a phenomenal job to unpack why theologically it's important for us to believe that Jesus was risen from the dead or rose from the dead. So that's on our YouTube channel. It's on our podcasts. If you want to take a deep dive into why this matters theologically, go and listen to Sikhle's sermon. Okay? I am rather going to spend time around these four reasons why the triumph of the king matters to us here today. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 to 4, and also in verse 11, here's what the Apostle Paul says. For I deliver to you, as of first importance, also what I received. First importance. There are a lot of things that are important, and Paul obviously knew a lot of important things. But what Paul is uh, going to list now are the most important things. And here's what he says. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. He was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And then Paul says in verse 11, Whether then it was I or they, so we preached and so you believed. Like this is the most important things that we ever preached to you and the most important things that you should know and that you should believe in. And that's why we, took, we take a whole Sunday to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Because it is one of those things of first importance. He died for our sins, he was buried, and he was raised on the third day. So before we jump in point by point, let me do a prayer for us, and then we'll get going. Lord Jesus, we know that you're alive. We know that the tomb is empty. We know that this means that you are the triumphant king. And we know that this really matters to us. So as we walk through the scriptures now, I pray that you would enlighten our hearts. I pray that you would illuminate our minds. I pray that you would help us see why hope for the world and grace for the broken and peace for the fearful and truth for the skeptic is so important. And may we see ourselves in all of those interactions in this chapter of the Bible. And may we experience it all as good news. I pray, Lord Jesus, that we won't be distracted now, that our minds wouldn't be at Monday, but that we would be here and present, and that we would learn much of you and glorify you in this time. I pray that you would have me speak the words that you want me to speak. In your name. Amen. Okay, so let's look at the first one. The empty tomb says that there is hope for the world. Now, the Gospels... And specifically, John says that this took place on the first day of the week. Okay? There's a shift to something new in the Gospel of John. And it is actually the dawning of a new creation. Right? It is a word of glorious hope. So Sunday, back in the day, was the first day of the week. So on Sabbath, which was the Saturday, Jesus rested in the tomb. And from this time onwards, the first day of the week becomes the day that believers have set aside for worship. Acts chapter 20 verse 7, 1 Corinthians 16 verse 2. It was a big deal that Jesus was resurrected from the dead, right? You would have people say to you, maybe in casual conversation, I can't believe in the resurrection because those kind of things don't happen. Exactly. The fact that it happens, or that it happened, is a big deal. And something radically new happened through the resurrection of Jesus. Let's walk through the scriptures. So we're going to cover verse 1 to verse 10 now. Just a few remarks that I want to make. And let me just say this. You guys, that I, you guys know that I usually do bold and underline in the text. And then I started studying this text. 
And I started bolding and underlining every single word. And I was like, hey, this is not going to work. So I just left the text for you as is. So Rudolf, if you can navigate with me, I'll really appreciate that. So it says this happened at dark, which is probably in that time between 3 and 5 a.m. Now the word dark is important because in the Gospel of John, darkness and light is a theme, right? As two opposing things moving from one to the other. So Mary Magdalene and others will go from a darkened understanding of everything that happened to the so-called light of the truth. And then the other Gospels indicate that there were other women with Mary Magdalene, as is implied in verse 2. And that is, so she went running. And in the other Gospels, they say, we, uh, so sorry, later in verse 2, she says, we don't know where they've put him. So she gets to Peter and John. She says they have taken the Lord and she's worried about where he might be. Grave robbers existed back in the day and it actually existed in that day too. Or she was worried about the desecration of Jesus' body. But what I want you to see is that she was not anticipating the resurrection. Neither were the disciples anticipating the resurrection. People often speak about first century people as primitive people saying that they probably believed in miracles but we can't because we are modern people i would like to put it to you that they also didn't believe that this happened and it's important for us to see that the disciples were not ready to believe in this miracle any more than any modern person think about it if they actually expected the resurrection the disciples were supposed to wake up that morning and go hey it's the third day come on guys let's walk to the tomb because jesus said that he'll be alive none of them said let's go and have a look not one single disciple so she has to go and get the disciples and she has to tell them and later we see that the disciples actually go into hiding right these weren't gullible people who couldn't think these were people who were really really skeptic about everything that happened because it was so out of this world i watched sing 2 recently and now all of a sudden the line out of this world doesn't sound right if i don't say it with gunter's accent out of this world have you watched sing 2 it's really great if you have kids you have to get to it if you don't have kids you can also watch it it's a really great movie anyhow so these ladies were on their way to the grave to do what? To anoint Jesus' body. They spent a fortune on spices and oils. And then all of a sudden, they find that the tomb is empty. And then in Luke, we see when they say that the tomb is empty, the word in the CSB is actually translated as nonsense. Right? What nonsense is this? People were saying it does not make sense at all. We see in Luke 24 that the people said we hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. But they didn't believe in his resurrection. So these people were just as skeptical as modern people. Greeks and Roman people didn't even believe in resurrection. They believed that you needed to be separated from your body. So when you died, whatever is inside your body should come out because your body is bad, but whatever is inside is good. So they have to be separated. Jewish people in the time of Jesus actually believed in a resurrection, but they believed in the final resurrection when the entire world was resurrected. So not many people in Jesus' day believed in a personal bodily resurrection and also if you were a jew in that day you definitely weren't ready to worship a man made of flesh and bone like you as a god because that would be seen as blasphemy the presence now look at verse 3 of these two witnesses was sufficient for submitting evidence in jewish law and here we have two people right so mary magdalene runs and then she calls peter and she calls john both disciples then run, right? Can you guys see the urgency from one place to the grave? I like the fact that John says he outran Peter. I'm not too sure what we should do with it. Maybe we should just imagine Peter being like a defender and uh, John being like a winger or a striker or a midfielder. I'm not too sure. But what I do appreciate of John's humility is the fact that John says, even though I won Peter, the moment I got to the tomb, I was too scared to go in, right? So I am a rugby fan. Maybe Peter was like a six and John was like a 14. 
And when John got to the grave, he's like, oh, I'm just not tough enough. Boom, passes the ball to Peter. Peter smashes into the grave because that's what a six does. Who knows? But here we see that they get to the grave. John outdoes him in speed, but not in boldness. John peers into the tomb and Peter goes into the tomb. And what do they find? They find linen cloths that's lying there, but no body. It's unlike the resurrection of Lazarus, right? When Lazarus came out of the grave, um, he still had all of the cloths around his body. But Jesus' cloths are folded up. Have you ever wondered how that happened? Like, did he wake up and then he unraveled the cloths from his body? That's a legitimate, I think, uh, uh, guesstimate. Or, like, did Jesus wake up and then he just moved through the linen cloths? Because he could move through a door later in the story. So if he could move through a door, he could probably just shake off all the linen cloths. I don't know. And we also don't know. I'm just asking you, like, have you ever thought of that? Right? Because Jesus' resurrection body was the same and different in nature. So here's what they find. They find the cloth there. They find that the body is gone. And then it says in verse 8, John, who reached the tomb first, then also went in and he saw and he believed. John is another person, according to the Gospel of John, who saw and then believed. It's interesting that Peter doesn't believe yet. Do you guys see it? Like it's just not there. It would have been nice if it said, so Peter and I then looked at each other and went, snap! And then we gave each other high fives and then both of us believed. But we, the only thing we see is that John saw and John believed. So it's not necessarily a massively strong, robust faith yet, but it does appear that he believes. In Luke 24 verse 12, we read that Peter went away wondering to himself what had happened. And here in verse 9 it says, They did not yet understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Now obviously this scripture is not a single verse. It uh, alludes to the entire scope of scripture. And later, by the Spirit's help and also by Jesus' own teaching as an example in Luke 24, they are able to understand the scripture and they are able to understand everything that happened. And this resurrection of Jesus changed the way that they read the Bible completely. That also changes the way that we read the Old Testament as the first massive part of history of the story of God and His people. Because we know that in the end when Jesus got resurrected, He opened up a whole new way of life for everyone. And that was the fulfillment of all of those promises. So it literally changed everything for them. And then we see in verse 10, the disciples returned to the place where they were staying. Like they went home. And they were trying to put all of this together. And we know through reading the rest of the New Testament that they did put it together in due time. If you read the book of Acts as an example, you see how the resurrection is central in the apostles' messages. If you look at the sermons in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3, uh, in Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 13 and 17, everywhere where there's a gospel proclamation, the resurrection is central in those messages. If you, if you look at some uh, gospel summaries in the New Testament, like Romans 1, Romans 10, 1 Corinthians 15 and 2 Timothy 2, you see the resurrection in the middle of it all. Okay. Paul says in Romans 4, as an example, he was delivered over the death of, uh, for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if he hasn't been raised, we are still in our sins. So the resurrection is the thing that broke open this whole new life that Jesus gives to us. And that means that there is hope for the world. So just think about my first point. The empty tomb says that there is hope for the world. Why? Because by faith in Jesus Christ, we have been raised with Him. 
by faith in Jesus Christ, we will also receive a new body. By faith in Jesus Christ, we will inherit a new earth. By faith in Jesus Christ, we will never weep again. We will never grieve again. We will never attend a funeral again. By faith in Jesus Christ, we will never have relational conflicts again. We will never have aches and pains in our body again. We will never need to lock our doors or have ADT come to our place ever again. Because peace and righteousness will reign. Our faith will end, right, in sight and we shall see Him as He is. All because of the empty tomb. So right now there's life to be found and there's life to be found eternally because of the resurrection. Peter says in 1 Peter 3, Be ready to give a reason for the hope you have within you. Hope, fam, is something that is attractive to this world we live in. We live in a day in which people struggle with fear of death. They struggle with the meaningless of life. And do you guys see that the resurrection solves both of those problems? It's the best news in the world because it answers the question of life now and it answers the question of life beyond the grave. You don't have to fear death because Christ has risen. You can have new life because Christ has risen. Your life does matter. Why? Because Christ has risen. It answers all of our questions. And all of the questions that the people have with which you interact every single day. From your neighbors to your workplace to family members who don't believe in Jesus. The resurrection gives hope for the world. Can we just get some hope from it today? And can we then talk about this hope, speak about this hope, and share this hope with others? It's a hope for the world. We see that in the empty tomb. Let's look at the interaction between Jesus and Mary Magdalene. And we're going to speak about this grace for the broken. Do you guys realize that Mary becomes the first to tell others the good news of the resurrection? And in John, look at uh, verse 18, he uses her full name, Mary Magdalene, to just make sure that we know who he's talking about. Okay? There's a quote from J.P. Lange, or Lange. He says, the first Easter message addressed by Christ to the apostolic circle was discharged by a woman, a female disciple, who, without doubt, was formerly the great sinner. And now this great sinner, Mary of Magdala, right? That's where her name comes from. The Magdalene, Mary Magdalene. Um, all of a sudden, this great sinner who she was now receives three beautiful graces, right? She sees angels. She was, the, she was the first to see the risen Christ. And she was the first to proclaim that she had seen the risen Christ. If the disciples fabricated this account, they would not have told about Mary Magdalene for two reasons. Why? Well, because she was a woman. Most Marys are women, just saying. And according to the Mishnah, right, the Jewish book of the interpretation of their law, a woman's evidence was not admissible in court. So don't call a woman as a, uh, uh, as a witness of anything. There was a pagan Greek philosopher called Sal uh, Salsus. He lived in the second century and he opposed Christianity based on this very reason. The fact that women gave testimony to him being raised. He actually called the resurrection of Jesus the gossip of women about the empty tomb. And he also said one of the reasons we know that it can't be true is that it's based on the testimony of a woman. And then this is what Salsus says. It's not me. He says, we all know women are hysterical. Right? Women were marginalized in the first century. So if this was a fabricated story, they would have chosen a more compelling witness. And secondly, Mary Magdalene was previously enslaved by demons. We see that in Luke chapter 8 verse 2. She was possessed by seven demons. So if you're going to make up a story, you would definitely not pick a woman, and certainly not one who was demon-possessed as your key eyewitness. Yet, in all four Gospels, Mary Magdalene heads the list. So the only reason for all of them to include her in this story is the fact that she was actually there. Like this happened historically. And here we see that there's grace for this broken and enslaved person. 
Isn't that just absolutely beautiful? Jesus, the one who came to crush the head of the serpent, overcame Mary Magdalene's demonic life, and he actually made her a disciple. Verse 11 says why she returned to the grave. And then there's this beautiful interaction from verse 11 all the way through to verse 16 between the two of them. And I just want us to look at those quickly. Mary saw in verse 12 two angels in white. Okay? So their presence demonstrates that God has been at work. Through the whole Bible, if angels pitch, they pitch with what? They pitch with a message. They are messengers of God. So if you see angels, you can't go, I wonder what they're doing here. If you see angels, your reaction in the Bible should be, what's the news? Because it's clear to me that you are here on God's behalf. So the empty tomb can only be explained as an invasion of God's power. And then we see in uh, uh, verse 13 of chapter 20 that Mary is still, still struggling to believe in the resurrection right she's still stuck with her thought in verse 2 and that is that someone took Jesus now um, they wait 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 so, so sorry I got lost in my own notes here let me just say something about the garden which I think is also really really important the fact that it's mentioned that she's in the garden the fact that it's mentioned that she confuses Jesus to be a gardener is really, really significant. Where else did we find a garden, fam? In the beginning of the story, right? And who was called to be the very first gardener? Well, his name was Adam. So God said, work and take care of my beautiful creation. Did Adam do what he was commissioned to do? No, he didn't. Eventually, sin entered the world through Adam and it messed up the whole garden. Now Jesus is in a garden again. Paul talks about Jesus as the second Adam, meaning in the same way that something came into the world through Adam, something new came into the world through Jesus, this second Adam. And what is that? Well, new creation. Okay, awesome. So where does this new creation start? It starts in the garden. Okay, cool. So now Jesus looks like a God, the one working this new creation. So Jesus starts talking to Mary. Mary talks to him. He was recognizable, but he was definitely different, right? Because he didn't look the same way, battered and disfigured like he would have been at the cross. And now Jesus asks her this beautiful question that conveys his love and affection. He asks her, why are you crying? Look at verse 15 with me. Woman, Jesus said to her, why are you crying? That's the first question. And the second question is, what are you looking for, right? Who is it that you are seeking? I want us to see that Jesus cares about the tears of Mary Magdalene. But then he also asks the question in a way that helps us to understand that this is a time of celebration. It's not a time of mourning. Think about this, fam. All other books that we've read in the Bible that had heroic characters in them ended with a funeral, right? Genesis ends when Joseph dies. Deuteronomy ends when Moses dies. Joshua ends when Joshua dies. The gospel ends when Jesus lives, right? When he's resurrected. So it's funeral, 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 resurrection. A brand new hero story. So it doesn't end with a funeral to weep at, but with a resurrection to rejoice in. And then... Jesus asks her, what kind of Messiah are you seeking, right? Who are you looking for? And then Jesus calls her by name. This is also really important. Do you guys recall John 10, where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my disciples, and they, they know me, and they know my voice. So Jesus knows his disciple, he calls her Mary, and then what happens? She recognizes his voice as her shepherd and then she breaks out an exclamation and then she calls him Rabuni it's a really difficult word to say because I say it read as an Afrikaans person I don't know how to say it in English is it Rabboni is it Rabuni I don't know but she calls him teacher right this is a exalted 
confession about who Jesus is. And she's really excited. Why? Because Jesus was a teacher before his death. And now she recognizes him. And she says, teacher, yes, I've got you back. And then she clings to him. And then what, is, what does Jesus say to her? Listen, I'm not going anywhere, right? You don't have to cling to me now. Like, I'm leaving you guys way later. But it doesn't happen now. You can let me go. Uh, if we pick up our kids when they had a sleepover at the grandparents, it's always great to see them run to us. Sometimes Katie even shouts, SHOT! And then she jumps, boom, I pick her up, and then she hugs and holds me. Why? Because it's really great to see me again. And then what do I say? Okay, book. Okay, all right, book. It's for, I'm here, like not going anywhere. I know that I was away back now, but like I'm back for good. You can let me go. Jesus says to her, you don't have to cling to me. I haven't ascended yet. I'm not going anywhere. It's time to announce this good news. It's so much grace in the life of Mary Magdalene. Do you guys see it? Jesus offers her a brand, brand new life. And that means if we read this, we should know that there's hope of change for us as well. If you want to know if you can change, look no further than Mary Magdalene. If you want to know if other people can change, look no further than Mary Magdalene. Because it's the Savior's grace that, offers, uh, that changes your heart. And what I want you to see is not only does it change your heart, but Jesus also offers you a new family. Do you guys see this word play? Go to my brothers, look at verse 17, and tell them that I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. He reminds Mary in these words that she's part of something brand, brand new now. And that is the family of God. That's why I had us look at one another when we had communion earlier. Like, just look at your fellow brothers and sisters. All of us, <clears throat> one new family. Lives made new, called into a new family. Everyone in this world we live in, fam, is longing for community. And on this first Easter morning, the ultimate community is identified. And we now call that community the church. The church is a beautiful community all of us are invited into. And we were designed for fellowship. We were never made to live out our faith alone and to be miserable. Christianity is familial. And that's why fellowship is in our name, actually. Right, let's look at the last two. Jesus and the disciples, peace for the fearful. And then Jesus and Thomas, truth for the skeptic. I'm almost done. Take a deep breath. We're going to get there now. Okay. Despite turning away from Jesus at the cross, Jesus appears to these disciples. Verse 19 says, He miraculously passes through the door, or the door miraculously opens. And then what does He say to them? Nice one, gents. Thank you for running away when the going got tough. What were you guys thinking? How are you ever expecting me to forgive you for this? Is that what Jesus says? Absolutely not. What does Jesus say to them? Peace be with you. Wholeness for you. Healing for you. You know that feeling when you don't feel like you need anything? Like the world is just right? That's what Jesus is communicating to them. Peace be with you. Why? Because in John 19, Jesus said, it is finished. So the work has been accomplished and now the peace is given to you. That's the gracious, beautiful, merciful and loving words of Jesus. He doesn't give them a hiding. He doesn't give them a speech. He gives them what they want. Do you guys think that they were fearful? Of course they were. Do you guys think that they were worried? Of course they were. Do you guys think that they were anxious? Of course they were. They just flushed three years of their life following this man and now he's dead. And now they have to make a comeback to their old lives and try and figure out what to do with all of this. What does Jesus say? Peace. Peace. Be with you. And how do they react? The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. They are glad, fam, because that is what grace does. That is what peace does. 
it makes you glad. Are you glad? Because if you're not, you need some grace and peace. I'm just going to slip this one in here. You know my WhatsApps that I always type to you guys? Do you guys see how I sign it in the end? Grace and peace. Every single time. Not because it's a nice thing to say, but it's because I believe that's what you need. Because if you have grace and you have peace, you will be glad and you will experience joy. And then this glad group of disciples gets a mission from Jesus. Guys, just think about this. You all played a really poor game on Friday. You were nowhere to be seen. I'm never going to choose you guys again. That's not what Jesus does. Jesus chooses them again. Despite them playing a really poor game on Thursday night and Friday morning. Like, they were shocking. And he still chooses them. And he gives them this mission. And how does he state this mission? As the Father has sent me, I also send you. This is John's version of the Great Commission. We see in John 17 that Jesus says, As you send me into this world, while he's praying, Jesus says, So I have sent them into this world. And then in verse 22 it says, Jesus breathed on them. That's not a random remark. What did God do to the first human in the garden when he created them? He breathed on them, right? His breath went into their noses and that gave them life. And now we see this new gardener looking at his people and breathing on them so that they can have life. And not any kind of life, life eternally, life in abundance. And he says, receive the Holy Spirit. Also meaning that I'm not sending you out onto the field in your own strength. You'll get everything from me that you need. And then in verse 23, let me just clarify this. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. This doesn't mean that the church or individual Christians have the ability to forgive sins. Okay, this is quite important. What this means is we proclaim forgiveness for sins in the power of the Spirit. So that what? People can know that God forgives them when they trust in Christ. So if we don't proclaim, what happens? They won't find that forgiveness. So what should we do? We should keep on proclaiming it. So that people can find that forgiveness. And that they can find their grace. Only God can forgive. But we need to tell people that. With our words. Not only with nice gestures. So that they can believe. Let's look at Jesus and Thomas. Last one. People call Thomas Doubting Thomas. I don't know if we should, but maybe for this morning, let's call him Doubting Thomas. Have you guys ever wondered why Thomas doubted? At least just either nod or shake your head. Like, have you guys ever wondered why Thomas doubted? I have. I mean, I've taken runs on every single still Saturday or Holy Saturday over the last 10 years. Here's what I think made Thomas doubt. I think Thomas was sorrowful. I think Thomas had a massive religious disappointment. I think he was just gutted. He was gutted that he put so much trust and so much effort and so much of his life into this and it didn't work out. He had so much hope and now his hopes are in the tomb. He was a Jew, so he did believe in miracles, but now the miracle didn't happen. He felt as though he got put in checkmate. Do you guys remember Lesechel used that as a metaphor a couple of weeks ago? Checkmate is a terrible feeling. <laughs> Thank you for the clicks. Checkmate is a terrible feeling because you've got nowhere to go. And that's how he must have felt. And often doubt stems from being greatly hurt in life. Have you ever been hurt? Have you ever experienced hurt? Has that made you sorrowful? And has that made you doubt? I think all of us can nod to that. That's why Thomas doubted. Now Thomas says, look, I am gutted. So if I'm going to believe this, I want to see it for myself. 
Like, it, he might have a twin. I don't want any swaps. I don't want someone that kind of looks like Jesus. I want no fakes here. And I mean, look, fam, I love you all, but I'm not going to believe you guys. I want to see it myself. I want to give it my own vote. I've got my own decision to make. And then, do you guys see in verse 26, it says, A week later, this interaction happened. Can you guys imagine what Thomas's week must have been like? He must have had a real struggle. Just think about it. He can't be alive, right? I mean, what kind of Messiah dies on the cross? But now they say that he is alive. But he appeared to women. But I actually can't use that as an argument because he also appeared to the men. And they will see him and they will believe. And I mean, he was an awesome guy. And he did say a lot of remarkable things. But he still died. But they say he's alive, but I haven't seen it. Can you guys imagine that week? It must have been hardcore. You know, if you read an article on climate change or on veganism, you talk about it the whole time. And sometimes your close people go, please just stop talking about it. It's like me with my new running watch. So I got this running watch as a present from some friends. So now I can't stop talking about my watch because I always find new functions on it. And then Marie goes, dude, please. I don't want to hear anything more about your VO2 max or your oxygen saturation while you sleep, your sleep patterns or your REM. I want nothing to know of it. I think that's what Thomas must have been like that week, right? He probably spoke about it so much. And now Jesus appears to him. And what does Jesus say? You doubter. You of little faith. No! Jesus says, peace to him. Look at it. Uh, A week later, Jesus stood among them and he again said, peace be to you. And then he invites Thomas to him and says, don't be faithless, but believe. Fam, if people say, I have questions about the Bible, if I I have questions about the Lord, I have questions about these things, you should say, you should say, awesome, let's tackle them. Because questions will lead you to believe. We often say, excuse me, look, that's a little bit above my my pay grade, I won't be able to answer these questions for you. You shouldn't have questions. You should have questions. And then you should get the answer. Jesus says to him, don't be faithless, but believe. And then Thomas drops this ripper of a confession. He says, my Lord and my God. One of the greatest confessions of the deity of Jesus in the New Testament. And it also circles back to John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So this word is Jesus all through John. And now uh, Thomas looks at him and says, My Lord and my God. Like he's the one who this book spoke of uh, in the very, very first pages. And he makes that confession. I think that every day we must all bow down like Thomas and say to the living Lord, My Lord and my God. What a beautiful, beautiful interaction. Truth for the skeptic. We have many skeptics among us. There's truth for all of us. And then the last two verses, verses 30 and 31. Grace is for anyone who will believe. Right? John includes us here today in his story. By saying that these are written so you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. Right? Many people saw Jesus and believed, and many people didn't see Jesus physically, but also believed. We are those people. And the purpose of this whole book and this whole story was so that we can believe, that we can have life in His name. Think about this, fam, and I'm going to land with this. The risen Jesus meets each of these people in their conditions. And he transforms them. Mary goes from enslaved to evangelist. The disciples go from fearful to fearless. Thomas goes from doubter to devoted missionary. 
And Jesus can do the same for you and I. And he can do the same for any person not sitting in this building here today. Isn't it just phenomenal news? The triumph of the king. It matters. And here's why it matters. Let me uh, read you a poem. And then we'll be done. This is from a uh, historical figure in the church. His name is John Chrysostom. He says, Christ is risen and you, O death, are annihilated. Christ is risen and the evil ones are cast down. Christ is risen and the angels rejoice. Christ is risen and life is liberated. Christ is risen and the tomb is emptied of its dead. For Christ, having risen from the dead, has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. To Him be the glory and power, now and forever, from all ages to all ages. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we know that You are risen. We know that death is annihilated. We know that the evil ones are cast down. We know that the angels rejoice. We know that we are liberated. And we see the transforming work that you did in the lives of the people that we read about this morning. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would do the same in us. That you would breathe your life into our nostrils. That we would feel and experience the Holy Spirit in our lives again. And that we would also move from enslaved to evangelist, from fearful to fearless, and from doubting to devoted. Do a great work in us, Lord Jesus, for your glory and for your honor as we proclaim the risen Christ. We pray that in your name. Amen.